Hello, so good morning, and today I'll be going through the topic of chemical energetics. So a good analogy for what is happening in a chemical reaction is a ball rolling down a slope. At the top of the slope, the ball is highly unstable and it has high potential energy, in this case, gravitational potential energy. And this and, and when it rolls down the slope, right, what happens? It loses gravitational potential energy. And this gravitational potential energy is converted to kinetic energy. And at the base of the slope, the ball is now in a more stable position. That means it has lower gravitational potential energy. So the same thing is happening during bond formation. So two separate atoms have a certain electrostatic potential energy due to the position of the electrons and the nuclei. And when the bond is actually formed between the two atoms, it, it lowers the electric potential energy of the system. And this and the loss in potential energy is converted into heat, light, etc. So bond formation always releases energy in an exothermic process. Bond breaking always absorbs energy in an endothermic process. So I'm sure all of you have learned this in secondary school already. As for an exothermic reaction, right? There is a delta H less than zero. And for endothermic, delta H greater than zero. So let us take a look at some definitions of enthalpy changes first. So first you need to define what is standard conditions. So because two different chemists may be investigating a same reaction, but their value of enthalpy change will differ if they measure it under different conditions. So we have to do it under, stand, under a certain uh, defined set of conditions everywhere around the world so that results can be easily compared. So standard conditions is at 298 kelvins, pressure of 1 bar, no, it's not 1 atm, it's slightly less than 1 atm. And all concentration of aqueous reactants and products are 1 mole per dm cube. And all substances are in their standard states, which is the most stable form at 1 bar and 298 kelvin. For example, for carbon, it will be graphite. For hydrogen, it will be the uh, H2 gas. For uh, sulfur, it will be S8 and so on and so forth. It's basically the state which is the lowest energy for the pure element at the standard conditions. So standard enthalpy change of reaction is the energy change basically that a chemical reaction uh, uh, undergoes when the molar quantities of reactants stated in the chemical equation react under standard conditions of 298 Kelvin and 1 bar. So when you uh, multiply the coefficients by say a value of half, then you also need to multiply the enthalpy change value by half. <coughs> so for standard enthalpy change of formation, is the energy change from one mole of the pure substance in a specified state. So this is the thing you are forming. It's formed from its constituent elements in their standard states at 298k and 1 bar. So uh, an example is say if I want to form uh, ethanol, correct? I need to form it from its pure elements in the standard state. So I need to form it from 2 moles of carbon in the standard state, which is graphite, uh, 6 atoms of hydrogen, which is 3 hydrogen gas molecules, and half a mole of oxygen gas. So this is the standard uh, enthalpy change of formation of ethanol. So standard enthalpy change of formation elements by this definition would thus be zero. So let us take a look at the next one. It's a standard enthalpy change of combustion. which is the energy released when one more of the substance is completely burned in excess oxygen at 298k and 1 bar. So note that the delta H of this reaction is not the delta, uh, delta H of combustion, standard enthalpy change of combustion of methane. Why? Because H2O produced is a liquid state at 298k and 1 bar, so this should be liquid. So this one is also not the standard enthalpy change of combustion of carbon. Why? Because this uh, production of carbon monoxide is during incomplete combustion, but I'm talking about complete combustion here, so it should be CO2 as the product. Okay, 
And um, for standard enthalpy change of neutralization, is basically the energy change, or normally is the energy released when the acid and the base react to form one more of water under standard conditions. So the value for H plus and OH minus reacting together is minus 57.3 kJ per mole. So uh, the neutralization for strong acid strong base reaction is also approximately negative 57.3 kJ per mole. Why? Because all of the base dissociated to form OH minus, all of the acid dissociated to form H plus. Right? So basically the reaction between the strong acid and the strong base is just the aqueous phase reaction of H plus and OH minus ions. However, this is not the case for reactions involving weak acids and bases, for example, uh, ethanoic acid. Right? Ethanoic acid has a only partial dissociation in aqueous solution. So note that uh, we, uh, you can think of it as uh, Say we are wanting to react ethanoic acid with uh, with a uh, hydroxide, right? So let's say the hydroxide is fully dissociated. So you want to form H two plus CH three COO minus. So note that we have to do one thing first, which is to uh, expend some energy to fully dissociate the undissociated acid molecules in solution and only then is negative 57.3 kilo joules per mole only applies to this at uh, this pathway and by however by Hess's law this pathway which is the neutralization is equals to this pathway and this is exothermic so overall, I'm mean, sorry, endothermic. Why? Because you're breaking the OH bond. So overall, the energy change will be less exothermic than negative 57.3 kJ per mole. So the standard enthalpy change of atomization is a very tricky uh, definition. Why? Because it differs for an element and for a compound. So now let us take a look for an element. What is the definition? Is to form one mole of gaseous atoms from the element. So for example, the standard enthalpy change of atomization of fluorine would be half a mole of fluorine molecules. Why? Because you want to form one mole of gaseous fluorine atoms. Right? Uh, however, for a compound, there's no way to get, say, one mole of uh, atoms from a compound. So, if the energy absorbed to form uh, gaseous atoms from one mole of the compound, so standard enthalpy change of atomization of uh, let's say CH4 for example will be to form one more to break that one more of methane uh, molecules into one more carbon gaseous carbon atoms and four moles of gaseous hydrogen atoms right and the values for standard enthalpy change of atomization they are always positive because energy must be absorbed to break all the bonds between the atoms in the element or in the compound So let us look at the next one, which is bond dissociation energy. So it's the energy required to break one more of a particular bond. That means the bond energy of the CH bond, uh, sorry, the bond dissociation energy, my mistake. What energy is different as you see it? The bond dissociation energy of the CH bond in CH4 will not be equal to the bond dissociation energy of the CH bond in say R uh, C2H6 for example. Right? In contrast, bond energy is the average energy absorbed when one more of bonds are broken in the gaseous state. So the bond energy of the CH bond can be equal to average over the CH bond, bond strength in different molecules.
different compounds. Okay, so let us take a look at the next one, which is ionization energy. So first, ionization energy is removing one more of electrons from one more of gaseous atoms, very important gaseous atoms, to form one more of singly charged positive gaseous ions. And second, ionization energy is the next step of removing one more mole of electrons from the cations. Electron affinity is the opposite. It's accepting of one more of electrons, right, to form one more of singly charged negative gaseous anions. So note that the first electron affinity is usually exothermic because the attraction between the positively charged nucleus and the additional electron usually outweighs the additional inter-electronic repulsion. However, the second electron affinity is always endothermic because energy is needed to overcome the repulsion between the two negatively charged species, which is the anion and the electron, right? They repel each other. So um, now let us move on to the last few definitions. Uh, lattice energy is the energy released when one more of the solid ionic compound is formed from its constituent gaseous ions at 298k and 1 bar. So things to note is the solid ionic compound, so not in a molten state, right? And formed from its gaseous ions, so it is not the aqueous ions. So standard enthalpy change of hydration is the energy released when one more of a gaseous ions is hydrated. Hydrated simply means uh, surrounded by water molecules at 298k and 1 bar standard conditions. So a standard enthalpy change of solution is the when one more of a substance is completely dissolved in a solvent, right? The solvent could be water, right? To form an infinitely dilute solution at 298 Kelvin and 1 bar. So let us take a look at experiments to find enthalpy change values. Uh, more specifically, the method we are doing is calorimetry. So uh, Q equals to uh, mc delta t, which is the formula that we will be using, uh, where Q is the heat transferred into or out of a substance, m is the mass of the substance, c is the specific heat capacity of the substance, which is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of the substance by 1 Kelvin, which is an inherent property of a material. For water, it is 4. Point, around 4.2, uh, 4 right? Joules per mole per Kelvin. Uh, joules per gram per Kelvin and the change in temperature is delta T over here which in Kelvins or be degrees Celsius also works why? because it is a change right and 1 Kelvin increment in temperature is equivalent to a 1 degree Celsius increment in temperature so a student carried out a certain experiment to determine the heat capacity of a copper can using the setup below okay so we are given the initial temperature of water, the final temperature of water, so this is the change in temperature. So we know that the water must have absorbed heat, right? And where did the heat come from? Right, it comes from the burning, right? The burning of the fuel in the spirit burner, okay? And, uh, given the enthalpy change of combustion of methanol is minus 715 kilojoules per mole so we are determining the heat capacity of the copper can in joules per kelvin so let's write out the equation q equals to mc delta t we are trying to find the heat capacity of the copper can so uh, in this case the heat is transferred to the water so m so q uh, goes into two places so the first is the mass of the water times the C of the water, times the change in temperature of the water. And the second place that the heat goes to is the copper can. So we are trying to find the heat capacity, not the specific heat capacity. So it's a big C times delta T. So we, do we know what Q is? Yes, we do know what Q is, right? Q is basically the number of moles of uh, the, the fuel, which is methanol, times the Enthalpy change of combustion which is a heat which will get, give you the heat energy released in combustion. So uh, Q is number of moles of methanol times the enthalpy change of combustion of methanol. 
So what will it be? It will be the difference in this 0 0.5 grams divided by m of methanol, right? So uh, 12 plus 4 plus 16 times 715 in to convert it to joules, right? Okay, so we should let's see what you give us. Okay, it gives us a very large value. One 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 seven two joules, and so we can say that I uh, can suck this into the equation. One 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 seven two equals to m water c water delta t. What's the mass of the water? It's 150 gram because uh, the density of water is 1 gram per cm cube. So 150 cm cube of water equals 150 grams of water, right? So uh, 150 times 4.18 times the change in temperature, which is 17 degrees Celsius, plus C. And the copper can exist in thermal equilibrium in the water. So uh, the energy increase, uh, sorry, the temperature increase of the copper can will also be 70 degrees Celsius. And then we can then find what C is. So we get a value of 30.2 joules per Kelvin. Note your units, we converted kilojoules to joules here. So this, this value is in joules, this value is also in joules, this value is in kelvins. So it's 30.2 joules per kelvin. So now let us take a look at the next part which is energy cycles. So energy cycles is a main part of this topic and it's founded upon Hess's law. Hess's law states that let's say we have a uh, two, right, uh, a starting state and an ending state, and we want to find what is that energy change going from A to B. And it says that if you're unable to do to go from A to B directly, and if you to use a longer pathway, the energy change is independent of the pathway used, and it's only dependent on the starting state and the final state. Right, so Hess's law applies to energy, right? Energy changes or enthalpy changes. Okay. And so the first uh, rule that we can, uh, I mean, the first generalization that we can uh, use in exams is that the enthalpy change of reaction is the energy released when reactants are combusted. Minus energy release when products are combusted. Right, so uh, to prove this, you can use Hess's law. And let's say we are wanting to find out the energy change of this reaction over here. So I first try to combust the reactants. And so I realized that in order to balance the O, I need to add 302 on the downwards arrows. Right, and then I try to combust the products. So I realized you also need 302 to have complete combustion. And we realized that the cycle is complete now. As in we can say that the energy change of the reactions, the energy release when the reactants are combusted, which is this direction, and minus the energy release when the products are combusted, which is basically negative of this arrow. Basically when you reverse the arrow, you have to change the sign. Okay? So the next rule that we can do is that the enthalpy change of reaction is the energy change when forming the products minus the energy change when forming the reactants. So uh, to prove this, we can once again use Hess's law. So let us take a look at this reaction that we are looking for. All right. So um, this is the reaction we are looking for, and uh, is the energy change enthalpy change of reaction is the energy change of forming the product. So what you, what do you remember from the definition? Forming is always forming from the 
constituent elements in their standard state. So we write down the constituent elements at the bottom, and then we realize that uh, we can complete the cycle by forming the pro the products and forming the reactants. And by Hess's law, the energy change of reaction equals negative the energy change of forming the reactants, right? Because negative while you are going against the arrow, so it minus, and plus the energy change of forming the products. Okay, so we have proven the second generalization. So let us now take a look at the third generalization, which is the enthalpy change of reaction is the total energy of bonds broken in the reactants minus total energy of bonds formed in the product. So this is very intuitive because uh, we have to break bonds in the reactants and form bonds to form the products, right? And But we can prove this using Hess's law once again. So let's say this is the reaction we are looking for. And so the enthalpy change of reaction, uh, we know we are now we are trying to express in terms of bond broken, right? Bonds broken, uh, bond energy, or bond dissociation energy to be more specific. So it is uh, when you break the bonds, right? We are breaking bonds in the gaseous state, right? And then forming what gaseous atoms. So we write the gaseous atoms at the bottom. And then we realize that uh, we, uh, we can complete the cycle by breaking the bonds uh, in the reactants and forming the bonds in the product. So it's basically that, and because energy of bonds is defined uh, based on endothermic values, right? Defined based on bond breaking. So it's the total energy of bonds broken minus the total energy of the bonds formed in the products. So let us practice Hess's law once. And so given the following enthalpy change, what is the standard enthalpy change of formation of gaseous hydrogen chloride? So there are a few steps. Right? The first step would be to write out what is the standard enthalpy change of uh, what is the standard enthalpy change we want to find. The standard enthalpy change of formation of HCl gas. So we have to write out the equation, right? So we form from its constituent elements in their standard state. And so the second step normally is to write out the equation corresponding to the enthalpy change values, right? That they give. So uh, sometimes they won't be so nice, they will give uh, values like correct. They give something like this. Instead of giving this reaction is 90 minus 92, they may give the enthalpy change of formation and H3 uh, would be negative 46 kilojoules per mole, and then you have to write out the necessary equation. But over here, they are quite nice, they gave you the values. So we can start to form the energy cycle. So normally, I would advise that you write the, required, the, the desired equation at the top. And then uh, from there, we proceed. So um, we realize that, the uh, let me erase this so I can get more space. It's not wrong, let's still get more space. And so uh, we realize that uh, we can use uh, react HCl with NH3. So uh, we can either write NH3 on the arrows, or for better bookkeeping, which I prefer, you can write it at the side. But when you write it at the side, le right hand side, you need to write it on the left hand side as well. So uh, we react with NH3 to form NH4Cl, right? And why is this process in minus one seven six kilojoules per mole? And then we realize that from NH4Cl, we can uh, try to reach closer to the value on the left hand side. Cause, why? Because you want to complete the cycle, right? Then you can apply Hess's law. Right? There's Cl2 in this cycle, so there's Cl2 over here, so you can just reverse this equation. But then you have to everything you have to divide by 2. Right? Because one more NH4Cl. So what is this? This is plus 6 to 9 over 2, right? Plus because we reverse the sign of the equation and we have to change the, uh, and then we have to divide by 2 because we divided the molar co uh, the stoichiometric coefficients by 2. And then we realize that we can finally complete this, right? By forming, uh, by uh, getting, or rather, by forming NH3 right from these elements so it is half times minus 92 
So we can then uh, conclude that the this sorry uh, that this delta H of the reaction that you want to find equals this pathway equals to this pathway. So we uh, we go against the arrow we take a minus minus half times minus ninety two minus six two nine over two minus minus one seven six and what do we get? You get minus ninety two point five kilojoules per mole. But now I tell you that there's actually a better uh, what some may prefer a more simpler method to solve this and that is by doing the algebraic method. So the way to do it is to first draw a horizontal line, write the equation we want at the bottom. And then we see that on the right hand side we want HCl. On the left hand side, we, we want H2 and Cl2. So on the right hand side, we want HCl. Where is the HCl in the three equations on top? It's present over here. And so for the HCl to appear on the right hand side, you need to swap this equation over. And then we write the uh, value of the enthalpy change. So because you swapped it, you need to swap the sign. Okay, so then we got HCl already. Then we've realized that we have oops, we actually have an NH3 additionally on the right hand side. We got to get rid of it. How? By having an NH3 on the left hand side. Right, so how do we do that? We swap this equation and divide the stoichiometric coefficients by 2. So NH3 to form half N2 plus uh, 2 H2. Right, so uh, what is the uh, which is you sub the sign so it must be positive now and you divide it by 2 so it's plus 46 right and then uh, finally we want some Cl2 right on the left hand side so you can do that by having this equation but we times everything by half Right, so that there's half Cl2. Did we have to stop the sign? We did not have to, so it's but we divided the coefficients by 2. So uh, then we realized that uh, things on the left hand side and the right hand side of the equation, uh, of the arrow sign, I mean, we can uh, cancel them out. So NH4 Cr uh, cancels out. Right, uh, half N2 cancels out, NH3 cancels out, and uh, 3 over 2 H2 cancels out with 3 over 2 H2 here, leaving what? Half H2. Right, so you get half H2 plus half Cl2 gives you HCl, which is the equation of V1. And so you just add the things up over here, and we should get negative 92.5 kilojoules per mole, which increases our answer on top. So now I introduce you to uh, another form of energy cycle which is called the energy level diagram and so uh, how we would construct an energy level diagram is that uh, we have to plot it in terms of a y-axis of energy values right so uh, elements in the standard states are assigned an energy of 0 kilojoules per mole and when there's a process which is exothermic we point down process as endothermic we point upwards and the larger the magnitude of the change of the energy change the longer the arrows right other than that it is basically almost identical uh, to a normal energy cycle so let us take a look at born haber cycle which is another special energy cycle so there are a few steps uh, that we need to uh, keep in mind so uh, this is a useful guideline right atomization ionization Electron affinity, lattice energy, and formation. Right? So, some people came by some mnemonics, you can try to find your own mnemonic. So, uh, what do I mean by this step? So, Born Haber cycle is you want to find what? The lattice energy of a certain ion solid Mx. Right? It is the energy change in this 
reaction, right? Forming the one more of the ionic solid from the constituent gaseous ions. So uh, we first need to form these gaseous ions from the elements in the standard state. And then uh, so the lactic energy can be found by a Hess's law. And these are the steps A, I, E, L. So basically we start from the elements in the standard state. Oops, I've actually forgot an important thing, which is the vertical axis. Energy starts at zero at the elements in the standard state. So we atomize both elements, the matter and the non-matter. We ionize the matter to form uh, the metal cation and the electron. Pass this electron over to the uh, non-matter to form the anion and then let this energy eat to the ionic solid. And you can complete the cycle through the center enthalpy change of formation of the ionic solid. So let us try constructing a bond haber cycle for this to determine the lattice energy of NaCl. So I'll use this line as the vertical axis. So we start with the elements in their standard state, Na. Okay, and we atomize Na first, so that's plus one zero seven. Then we realize that we need to atomize uh, chlorine. Uh, but atomizing uh, chlorine, do you agree with me, is uh, to form one mole of chlorine atoms, which is the same as breaking 0 0.5 moles of ClCl bonds in 0 0.5 moles of Cl2. So we can simply do a 0 0.5 times the bond energy of ClCl, 242. Then we ionize sodium is plus 502 then we uh, transfer the electron to chlorine so it's electron affinity of chlorine right and then we can do the lattice energy to form NaCl In this, the formation of NaCl is minus 411. Okay, so we can say that uh, this process uh, is equivalent to this process, right? So let this energy equals 355 minus 502 minus half times 242 minus 107 minus 411. So let these energy values are normally very large, but the strong uh, electrostatic attraction between the gaseous uh, ions. And indeed, we get a large value of negative 786 kilojoules per mole. Okay. So let us now take a look at the last part of this topic, which is entropy and Gibbs free energy. So entropy is the measure of the disorder in a system. The more disorder a system, the larger its entropy. The entropy is also a measure of the different ways a system can arrange itself. A system with more different ways of arranging itself has a higher entropy. So change in entropy, uh, right, is basically the final uh, entropy state minus the initial entropy state. Uh, delta S greater than zero, final state more disordered. Delta S less than zero, final state less disordered. So we said that processes are favored when there's an increase in entropy. So this is a fundamental uh, uh, scientific uh, principle. Processes are favored when there's an increase in entropy. In other words, when delta S is greater than zero. So factors affecting entropy, I'll go run through this quickly. Mixing particles increases the disorder, increasing entropy. Increase in temperature also increases entropy. So uh, understanding this, you have to look at the Maxwell-Boltzmann uh, distribution curves. So at a higher temperature, there's a broadening of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve, which you agree with me, would open up more possibilities of kinetic energy uh, that the uh, particles can uh, possess, right? It basically, uh, the distribution of kinetic energies become more diverse. And so there's more, uh, oh, you say more energy states that particles adopt, uh, thus more, being more disordered and entropy increases. So change in phase uh, obviously affects entropy as well. From a solid to a liquid, rigidity is lost, increasing disorder, increasing entropy. Liquid to gas, even greater increase in disorder, and thus even larger increase in entropy. 
Lastly, because gas molecules are so disordered, any process which results in an increase in the number of gas molecules normally has an increase in entropy. So both entropy changes and enthalpy changes in the reaction determine whether it will occur to an appreciable extent. The standard gibbs free energy change of reaction, delta G, captures both if effects, so delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Delta G uh, less than zero reaction spontaneous, sorry there's a typo here. Delta G uh, greater than zero reaction is non-spontaneous. So note that in chemistry, spontaneity just means uh, energetic feasibility, right? Or thermodynamic feasibility. It has nothing to do with reaction rate. So uh, a reaction can be uh, spontaneous but not observed to occur at room temperature and pressure uh, because rate is low and this could be uh, due to a high activation energy so a good example of this would be carbon in a diamond form to carbon in graphite form. You don't see diamonds spontaneously converting to graphite, right, at room temperature and pressure. If not, a lot of jewelry business will become bankrupt. Uh, however, this is actually a spontaneous reaction. So delta G, sorry, delta G is less than zero, right? Uh, however, because it has a high activation energy, the rate constant is extremely small. Hence, this reaction is not observed to occur. Okay, so I've come to the end of this topic and I hope that this video has helped you. Thanks for watching.